Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, does the moderators want to say anything before we begin? I think everybody's back already, so let's all now welcome QJ for the final presentation today. And he's going to be discussing about judging in a foreign environment. You can go ahead now, QJ. Thank you, Stephen. Um, just gonna quick uh post a quick question. If you can hear me, uh, it'd be very nice uh if I can get some confirmation just to make sure that I am speaking that my mic is working. Great. Thank you very much. I've already started sharing my slides as well. Um, if you have not. Uh, done so you can go to uh, you can see the title slide by clicking on my name and then on the join stream button and you will see a very beautiful picture of uh, this is the entrance of Aoba Odin Street in Shizuoka um, it's a street full of very tiny audience uh, shops um, Odin is like skewers of various stuff like fish cake or radish uh, that's uh, simmered in, in soup for a very long time and each of these shops are so small they can only sit like a handful of people in, in, at each time it was a very unique um, and uh, interesting experience to, to, to have dined in one all right let's begin proper again hello and thank you so much for joining me today um, i'm really excited to be able to talk to everyone all over southeast asia today again uh, To begin with, let's talk a little bit about myself. Um, my name is QJ and I am from Malaysia. And uh, in Malaysia, and actually for a lot of us in Southeast Asia, we are all uh, very much multilingual. We, like for myself, I am fluent in Mandarin Chinese, English, uh, Bahasa, uh, which is the local Malaysian language. There's Bahasa Malaysia and there's also the Bahasa Indonesia. Um, which are very similar, but there are some differences. Uh, Felix says he speaks food. Yep, um, I believe that is actually another common language between us Southeast Asians. Um, we are all very proud of our food. Um, the Malaysian versus Singaporean food uh, memes are a staple. <laughs> uh, so yes, um, while I am, or rather, we are, are definitely multilingual, what this seminar is not is that you don't want you to feel that you need to know the local language in order to judge in the foreign environment. Now, that is not the point of this seminar, and that's not the point of uh, what uh, I want to talk about today. And um, in the next uh, hour or so, uh, I'll be able to, I hope to be able to tell you why. A little bit more about me. Um, I am a GP slash Magic Fest addict, and I try to work as many events as possible. Uh, I try to go to every single Asia Pacific one, uh, and recently I've uh, managed to get myself to a handful of American and European ones. And of all of these events, um, something that makes Asia Pacific events very unique. Uh, is uh, how we are very much geographically and culturally diverse. Um, however, uh, these events are very far and very dist very very far and very few uh, between each other. So each of the events that we have are attended by even more diverse groups of people. So therefore, there was like a lot more uh, issues related to language barriers, especially in Japanese events. Um, but why uh, I might know uh, what I'm talking a bit more about what I'm talking about today. It's like um, my experience is that I started playing since 2001. I'm a sanctioned TO since 2007. I started judging in 2013. And 
I feel that I have this unique point of view where I have judged all of these events. And throughout all of these events, there are many judges who have been able to, to um, impress and really makes me feel odd about how uh, there's these judges who, without knowing the local language, are able to understand the problem, be able to give solutions to those problems, and have everyone leave the interaction happy. And I have this, uh, this um, unique point of view where I could understand all the languages that was involved in that interaction and how I managed to observe these amazing people handle themselves and how I myself have benefited from these observations and conversations with these judges. So I want to share this um, observations and experience that I have so that I can help everyone build a more positive experience for everyone. Not just between uh, judges and staff, but also between uh, players as well. And I believe the secret uh, comes from uh, communication skills. Again, um, you don't need to know the local language. Yes, it can be helpful, uh, but no, it's not necessary. Your knowledge, your experience, and your unique point of view is a valuable resource that can be beneficial to everyone. So again, um, a lot of this is, is uh, from my personal experience. If you have any of your experience and if you have any stories that you'd like to, to share, I uh, would very much like, uh, love to uh, hear from you as well. Uh, so feel free to share them on the text chat so that I can also learn from you. Now, um, what I hope you can take away from this seminar, um, I want you to be able to make the best out of your time, um, whether or not, uh, regardless of whether or not you want to, uh, what, what is your goal going into a foreign event? Do you want to have a, a, a very different experience? Do you want to embrace a challenge or do you just want an excuse to travel to somewhere a bit more different or somewhere that you, you have always wanted to go but never be able to, 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 to bring yourself go to? Um, I hope that this seminar will be able to help you make the best out of your time in that uh, environment, regardless of the reasons that you want to be there for. Um, another so another helpful thing that I, I think that might be able to help you in from this seminar is that you will be able to help your non-local players in your local game store. Um, maybe you, you have someone who is not local, um, a visitor or, or expat or someone who just recently moved over to work. Um, and I want you to be able to help, uh, help you break down those language barriers. Uh, and help them have a good time uh, at your local game store. And another thing is uh, improving communication skills. Uh, again, I mentioned this briefly earlier. The, the key of um, of this seminar is communication skills. And uh, whether or not you are at the event, I hope what we will be talking about today will help you understand others easier and also be understood easier yourself. So um, before we move on too much further, um, this was something that I previously prepared for the, the Greater uh, Magic Online Judge Online Seminar Series. And uh, I've gotten a lot of really great feedback and I've made changes to them. Um, and I really appreciate those. And I really hope that um, you hearing this today will give me feedback as well. Um, one of the feedback that really stood out to me that I really appreciate was that um, some people commented that this feels very much like a generic advice for judging seminar, sort of like a communications one-on-one -on -one skill. When facing a language or communication barrier, I think it's very helpful to take a more conscious effort to give attention on the way we communicate. Um, so yes, this is a communications one-on-one -on -one class, but in the context of judging events that are foreign for, uh, for you, so I hope this clear, uh, sets more clearer expectations. And uh, throughout the seminar, I hope to share as much stories and examples of situations or multilingual events as possible. And I hope you enjoy those stories. And again, um, if you would share your stories, uh, that would be great as well. Um, let me know what you think. In the feedback form, no nitpicking is too nitpicky. I would love to hear any, uh, any feedback, no matter how nitpicky it may be. 
All right, let's move in. Um, the first step is preparation. Being well prepared is uh, essential to any event, um, but this is especially important if you're attending a non-local event a non, uh, in a foreign environment. If you're already struggling with language barriers, for example, extra mental stress won't do you any favors. Don't stress yourself out by uh, on figuring out what's going to happen, how things are going to work, or what is expected from you. Um, on top of the potential communication barriers that you might be facing. Uh, a bad example is that um, I went to Australia in August, uh, and then I'm, uh, there was after a string of Japanese events in August where it was really hot, it's always summer, um, when in Australia, in case you didn't know, it is the exact opposite. So in August in Australia, it is the winter, and I was not packed at all for it. Uh, I remember, I think it was in the, the what was the bay called? When, uh, the, the bay overlooking Sydney Harbour, uh, and there's the Sydney Theatre, and um, I had to put on my just shirt <laughs> because I have no other clothes to wear. <laughs> Yes, it was. Um, it was not a. It it, it wasn't very good planning. Uh, so do your research. You know, uh, find out about the venue. Uh, don't forget about your accommodations. Uh, find out about uh, modes of transportation, ways to get around. Take care of yourself. You know, make sure that you have enough food to keep your energy levels up get enough sleep, uh, and also mental health. Uh, find people that you trust that you can be vulnerable with, so you can ask them for advice or just to vent or just to talk to someone. Uh, that helps you take care of your mental health as well, as well as uh, which is as important as your physical health. And also another uh, good thing about taking care of yourself is to drink water all the time, which I'm going to do right now. Keeping yourself hydrated. It's also a uh, very important part about taking your care of yourself and always ask for help if you need to. There is no greater uh, group of people that I know uh, as eager to help each other as judges. Uh, and let's keep it that way. Yes, Felix, uh, drink more water. Okay. Next part, um, communication. What does it really mean to communicate? As I mentioned earlier, um, while facing language or communication barriers, it's helpful to be more to take a more conscious effort uh, to give attention, to give extra attention to the way we communicate. And in my opinion, the first step of communication is to understand the other person. Establishing the foundations. Um, if you want to make yourself uh, easier if you want to make it easier for yourself to understand other people uh, you might you must begin by making others feel comfortable to want to communicate with you uh, first impressions are very important start with positive memorisms like uh, smiling uh, acknowledging that you have their attention with eye contact raise hand voice um, for example like if uh, forest judges if you're on the floor of the event uh, you notice a player raised his hand in front of you, but he's facing away from you, so he can't see you. So you can um, acknowledge his call by saying, yes, hi, hello, you know, get his attention. Uh, and then uh, once you have his attention, he can, he can see you, you smile, uh, just to make them feel comfortable. Um, speaking of which, I have a question for you, and I am going to post it in the chat. When you take a judge call in a foreign environment and uh, you want to welcome them with, uh, you want to talk to, um, start the interaction with a local phrase, is that A, a good idea, or B, not too good of an idea? Um, there's no wrong answers, don't worry. Just, uh, Choose the answer that speaks to you the most. And uh, which one makes you more comfortable? Uh, again, there's no wrong answer. 
because uh, I just want uh, you to to uh, tickle your brain a bit and um, imagine yourself in that environment. It's like um, a number of you uh, feel that is a good idea. Um, Sorry about that. Slight like distraction. So I want to make. Um, I agree with uh, the the people who voted yes. That is a good idea. Um, I I myself think that is a is one good way to make players feel more comfortable with you is when you start with uh with, with a local phrase. You know, like um, if you're in Japan, doshi you know, or you're you're in China. Hi, anyhow. Uh, uh, but you need to be very careful uh, when you do so. It yes, it does make them feel much more comfortable. It makes them feel more welcome. Just like just what uh, Stephen just posted in chat. Yes, it it really does, and it gives them a very good first impression. However, you need to be careful because you might this might lead into a misunderstanding that you know the local language that. If they think that you can speak the language, they might um, turn the interaction fully into their language as well. So this sets up um, some wrong expectations that might make them feel more uh, negatively if they if they then find out that you are not able to communicate with them in that language. Uh, Felix asks, do you have a personal experience that turns south because of such? Yes, yes. Um, when, so I know, I speak a little bit of Japanese and if they don't speak too quickly uh, and use more simple uh, ways of uh, saying what they want to tell me, uh, I'll be able to understand them. However, if they usually go in their normal speed of, of speaking, I will have much more greater difficulty of doing so. So, if you, if when I started saying, um, talking in Japanese, um, they switched to fully native mode, and I, I had difficulty understanding them. So I have to uh, tell them that I don't understand them that well. And please, uh, can you speak slower? Can you speak uh, more? Use more simpler words so that I can understand you. And yes, um, that's why you need to be careful. And how can you, what can you do about this? Is um, very quickly say the welcoming phrase, Doshimastaka, but set the expectations clearly very early on. Um, immediately follow that up with um, uh, English, okay? To make, let them know that I can only speak English. Is that okay with you? So um, one thing that was pointed out to me in uh, when I did this seminar last uh, in the, the greater online series is that there's definitely advantages uh, of learning the local language um, words and phrases of, of, of magic. For example, um, drawing, library, graveyard, untap, um, all those magic related phrases. If you could know the local uh, language equivalent of them, it definitely will be helpful especially if you want to extract certain information like uh, cards in hands or cards in certain zones. Um, some Japanese terms, for example, is very much um, modified English. For example, cardo or stark or draw, draw. And without me having to tell you what those words mean, you already know because they are very similar to words that we are very familiar with. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I speak uh, I speak Chinese. So for the first time I went to a Chinese event, I was full on confident. Like I'm, I've never judged in, in China before, but since I am a fluent Chinese speaker, I have no problem. I'm gonna be comfortable. I'm gonna be fit. I'm gonna fit right in. Uh, and the very first judge call that I got at the event was a very simple stack resolving issue uh, from uh, a new player. And uh, I struggled. I did not know how to answer her question because I didn't know how to say stack in Chinese. 
So if I had known, if I had bothered to learn uh, these phrases, I would have been no problem at all in handling the question. And, and immediately after that, I went and bothered every single Chinese judge, uh, the Ch uh, Chinese judge that I know, to teach me words and phrases, trample, untap, anything, and try to cram them into my head as, 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 uh, as fast as I can. Um, incidentally, the Chinese for stack is uh, dui die, which is basically translates into a pow. <laughs> All right, so, uh, oh, okay, we already done this. Next thing that can help you is uh, using non-verbal indicators or signals. Um, when we're trying to understand the other person, something that can help us understand them easier is uh, non-verbal indicators um, to help you find the context to the situation. For example, the board state, um, an empty board, depending on the time of the round, could uh, indicate be in the beginning or between games. Um, the body language or the tone of the voice will give you uh, more context on uh, how the person is feeling, uh, what sort of situation they might in. For example, if they look very relaxed uh, when they call you over and they're holding some cards uh, in their hand in particular, uh, it might indicate something like um, they want to know the oracle text or they need the translation for a text uh, in the card. Um, if they were holding their, the, the cards in their hands are all face down and they look like they're ready to get up, it's possible that they want to go to the bathroom. Um, if someone looks very frustrated, uh, there might be communication issues. Um, if they're holding cards and there's a complicated board, there might be some sort of gameplay mistake. So all these potential signals help you understand what the player is trying to tell you, even if they're English or whatever language that you and the player is trying to communicate with is not um, very, uh, it's not getting through. Second part about it is um, the third part of it, rather, on help and making uh, people feel comfortable about, uh, uh, make it easier for you to understand the others is making yourself feel that the other person understand, understood. Uh, Before we go into the techniques, I want to digress a little. Uh, the English is much more widely understood than it seems, uh, even in Japan and China. Compulsory English education is very common and stretches on many years. Uh, there's an impression, however, that these people, um, especially in Japan and China, do not understand or do not is not able to communicate with you in English. Um, why? The reason is that um, because they are taught by teachers without good pronunciation, um, their pronunciation is um, a little bit off. So it's very difficult for other people to understand them. Um, there's also the fact, uh, the issue of uh, confidence because they use it so infrequently and not being able to be understood easy reduce that confidence to even want to try. And before, because of these reasons, they are demotivated. They don't feel like they 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 don't feel like um, they it's worth it to attempt that because the, there's a fear uh, and shame of not being able to be understood that they don't want to try. So knowing all of this, there are techniques that we can do to take advantage. Give attention, like. Like I said, um, use eye contact, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Um, you make them feel like you have, uh, you have their attention, uh, and that they have your attention. Um, eye contact is a very useful way of doing this. Some people might not be comfortable with that. Uh, if they try to, if they, if when you give eye contact and uh, they avert eye contact, uh, they might, it's an indicator that they might be not comfortable with it. So instead, pay attention to what they are paying attention to instead. So if they are, they are looking at the board, uh, more focused on the board, then uh, let's pay attention to the same thing that they're giving attention to, to make them feel more comfortable. 
being patient is also very important. Use words like take your time uh, or affirm them like, uh, yes, it's okay, uh, can help. If they get stuck, encourage them to continue. Uh, an example would be when a person gets stuck while explaining. Uh, one method is you can do is to, to summarize. Um, you go through the scenario that they have told you so far and then have them continue from that point onwards so that in the between time, they can have uh, the ability to recollect the thoughts as well. And very importantly, we want to acknowledge and to affirm what they said. Confirming what they heard, uh, that confirming that they are heard makes them feel understood. Repeating what they said uh, to confirm what they were said. And then this helps them, uh, like I mentioned earlier, this helps them make them feel understood and comfortable. And this also allows you to make corrections in case when you're summarizing for them and then uh, there's a mistake either on your end or on their end, doesn't really matter. If there's a mistake, uh, this will, when you're summarizing for them to make them feel more comfortable, uh, this allows for corrections to be made if there was any mistake. Now, the key point here is that we want them to give, we want to be able to give them the confidence and the motivation to keep trying to communicate with you. Um, we've been talking about this in the context of player and judge interaction, but making other judges feel more comfortable uh, and encouraged to communicate with you is also very important and helpful. I have had feedback between, uh, I have uh, a lot of, um, what do you call those, uh, very grateful people who came to me to talk about how they appreciate me um, do, using the same techniques that I was talking about uh, earlier uh, to make them feel comfortable uh, and, and at ease to talk to me as well. The um, other judges, sorry, I should have um, made it more clear. So it's not just players who who can appreciate who will appreciate this, but other judges, other staff uh, that are not not that are foreign to you will appreciate this as well. All right, we are at the twenty five min uh, minutes. Uh, uh, we're at the twenty five minutes. Let's take a five minute break. And we'll continue at uh, 11.50. Uh, go grab a coffee. I'm going to grab some water. Uh, and we'll talk to you in another five minutes. So Mark in the chat mentioned that I've watched some documentary regarding why some Japanese don't speak as much English, especially in the provinces. One reason is some Japanese people think that foreigners should be the one to learn the local language as a, form, as a sign of gesture. I'm not sure how accurate this is. Um, this is not uniquely Japanese. I hope, uh, Mark, if you are still online and you didn't, uh, if you didn't, uh, went off yet, uh, if you, <laughs> if you are still hearing, if you are, um, I, I see you typing. Yeah, thanks for the confirmation. Um, it's not uniquely Japanese thing. It's um, this is this this, this is not uh related to judging anymore. So this is just a, a side conversation that we're having on the break. Um, I believe it's a problem that is quite prevalent. Uh, especially on the older generation, where they don't feel obligated to understand others. Okay. If people want to communicate with me, if I'm, I'm if I'm such a person with such a such a way of thinking, if people want to communicate with me, they should make the effort, not me. And thankfully, I think this is one something that is a. Uh, far less and less in this uh, more and more globalized world where we we want uh, and we feel a need to to want to understand others more um i don't like it uh, as as personal as um, uh, i mean obviously right otherwise i wouldn't be bothered to learn so many uh, languages uh and i feel that this is a very 
uh, not as nice way of uh, it's it's a is a is a an excuse is what I feel that I don't want to bother learning your language, so you should learn mine. Um, Again, uh, we we can't we, we can't generalize these things because uh, each individual might have their own individual reasons. Uh, it's just that I, on personally, I don't I, <laughs> I can't really I can't I can't really agree with it. Uh, Mark says that um, yeah, they mentioned that the older generation have this kind of mentality, and yeah, yeah, a bit sad, uh, but it is what it is. Um, Danica has posted the feedback form. Um, if you could give me any feedback at all at the end of this uh, seminar, that would be very, very appreciated. Speaking of Japan, however, I remember when the first time I traveled to Japan, uh, the amount of English being heard seen from signs or from maps, pamphlets and whatnot. Um, the first time I was there versus the last time I was there, there's a very big gap of uh, difference in the level of English being used. It's far more uh, far more friendly, especially with um, in, in recent years because of the uh, what they what they hope to be as the 2020 Olympics. There was a lot of efforts being pushed out in uh, making um, foreigners feel welcome and be able to 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 get around or talk to people or get what they want easier, especially in the major cities like Tokyo, Osaka, uh, or the major tur tourist destinations like Sapporo or, or, or uh, Kyoto. Uh, the further you get out of the the major cities, uh, the less obvious these things are, uh, and definitely there's a lot more. Uh, it's very easy to find English menus in uh, restaurants in in Tokyo or in Osaka. Um, if you go to a small town like uh, Toyama, uh, it's it's a lot more harder uh, to find. Uh, these things like uh, when we went to like one of the earlier slides we went to visit these rocks in uh, I believe it's Mie uh, this is the Mieto Iwa the married couple rocks in Ise uh, there was it was very difficult uh, if you didn't know how to speak uh, Japanese because it's a very tiny town the the train station uh, does not have ticket gates. You can just walk in to the <laughs> to, to the trains. There's there's no there's no staff, uh, and it's basically just a small shed with cover. So if people are waiting for the train, they they, they are covered. There's some vending machines and some exhibits, but that's it. Uh, there isn't anything else. Uh, uh, you just walk to the platform and then just board the train on your own. <laughs> so if you didn't know Japanese, there's no not much English to help you. There's no stuff that you might hope that they can they know Japanese. So the only other the, there's only other Japanese local local Japanese around there that might that might be able to help you. And if they don't know English, then you're kind of out of luck. <laughs> And the reason why we went to this gate is, of course, um, the APEC land. Uh, it was a. This was the very last trip before uh, the pandemic happened, so it's a very nostalgic trip. Oh, okay. So we are way over the time for our. Let me just skip ahead to where we stopped. By the way, if you have. Any any these slides where you feel that you might want to know the story of, uh, feel free to ping me. Uh, I'll, I'll love to tell you the stories about it. Uh, welcome back. I hope you had your coffee. I hope you've uh, refilled on your, your drinks of choice, your beverage of choice. Um, and uh, let's continue with the second part about uh, com uh, being understood.
Oh, uh, before that, um, there's, uh, let me just check on the chat. Uh, Neil says, new generation is definitely getting better in English. Mm -hmm. uh, Steven says, it's more on the people's mindset that they want or didn't want to learn a different language. Happened to me locally. Yep, um, it is definitely not just you. Uh, it happens here as well. Uh, it happens, I believe, it's a, it's a very common problem for everyone. Right, um, back to the slides. The second part we want to talk about is um, making yourself uh, being understood easier, um, making yourself heard. Um, so, so far we're talking about understanding the other person. On the other end, we also want the other person to understand us easily. So what can we do to make it easier? Um, first thing we, uh, the first things that we'll talk about is uh, verbally. Um, to make yourself easier to understand, uh, think about what you want to say, right? Ma and then make it easier. For example, we find out that a trigger was missed in the in the judge call. Um, what do you want to know? We want to know when it happened, right? Um, we want uh, we want to know when it happened so that we can decide whether or not we want to uh, how to fix this problem. Um, how do you communicate this without? knowing the language, how you, you can't exactly tell them um, when was this trigger missed they, because they might not understand the, the full sentence. So you can go uh, things like uh, trigger, missed, distant, last turn, uh, or you, if you want to know whether it's a main phase, combat, you, you turn it down to single uh, words and phrases so that it's easier for them to digest. So again, we want to use simpler words and shorter sentences, and we want you to, um, it's very easier, much more easier for them to understand you if you are speaking slower and also more clearer. Uh, back to the example on the trigger, let's say the trigger was uh, a beneficial trigger, and we found out that it was uh, two turns ago. So since it's been that long ago, we cannot put the, the trigger back on the slack. Uh, according to the, 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 the IPG. So how do you want to deliver the ruling? First, think about what you want to say, like uh, like we, we talked about just uh, briefly earlier. Um, we mentally prepare it in our head. Um, for example, we want to say, so the trigger was missed two turns ago, and because we it's far too long since the, the trigger was missed, we won't be able to let you put this back on the stack. Now, this is a very simple sentence and it usually would be understood e uh, easily. However, in a foreign environment, in, if in the case of someone not understanding the language, uh, it's not used to uh, English, you will have trouble to communicate this because they won't, you know, they won't, they won't be able to understand you. So how can we simplify this? I would go two turns ago, Trigger, missed, so forgot. You already forgot, so no more trigger. Please continue. And this turns the entire sentence into just a few uh, words or phrases. And um, I probably could have said it slower. I call, probably should have uh, said it more clearer as well uh, in, in, instead of what I just did. And this will help them digest it in their head a lot more easier. Another way of uh, doing, making yourself being understood easier is uh, through non-vocal methods. Like some gestures are um, universal, you know, nodding your head, shaking your head, thumbs up. Um, and Felix says, food. <laughs> Felix, are you, are you really that hungry? <laughs> Uh, Steven says, uh, keeping it short and simple, yes, that's, um, that's always, uh, that, that is very useful for a lot of things, not just uh, about communication. Um, so we're talking about uh, using non-verbal methods in, in making yourself being understood. Um, there is ways that you can do, like using the cards, the tokens, the spells, 
um, you want you use them to help you visualize the game actions or use them as physical representation of uh, what the stacks are. Um, if you want to know, uh, for example, oops. For example, if you want to know the number of cards in your hand, your uh, cards in hand, uh, you put emphasis uh, emphasis on cards and then point on their hand. You know, how many? Uh, if you see that oh, there's three cards, you, you use your fingers to show three. Uh, or using the spells uh, on, on, on available to you on the battlefield, you know, you take out the graveyard and you line them up as to try and physically represent what the stack looks like. Um, the Giant Cup Noodle is from... Um, this is Nagoya. Yes, this is Nagoya. I believe the year before was the first time, or it should be Chiba. It was the first time that I saw personally in uh, an Asia Pacific event where the GP, the main event of the of the Magic Fest, has additional uh, sponsored prizes, where the winner of the GP um, gets one year's worth of uh, cup noodles, and it was sponsored by Nissin. So there was this giant cup noodles in the feature match area. Where, uh, where the players will be playing and that the cup noodles are very obvious in the feature match area uh, when there's coverage and that they're looking at the players. Uh, you'll be able to see these giant cup noodles and a big stack of uh, regular size cup noodles as well. Uh, in Nagoya, they were even giving this out uh, cup noodles to visitors at the front entrance. So that was, um, that was fun. Subin says, I want some cup noodles now. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of that's kind the whole reason why they wanted to do this uh, sponsorship, right? They want to create uh, brand awareness. And look, it's being spread all the way so many months after, all the way to here. So I would say that's a very, very smart and very um, effective advertising. Uh, Felix asks, how many can you get? Uh, I believe there was one, but they didn't keep track of your name or anything, so you probably can just come back uh, through the entrance over and over again if you want to get as many as you want. <laughs> right, so there are times where probably giving up is the right choice. So how do you recognize when it's time to give up? Um, Sometimes the player just play out refuse to communicate. You know, there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, when the problem seems far more complex than it initially seemed, uh, there is an issue that you might need to investigate for potential uh, cheating, uh, which will disqualify the player. So what can we do when now that we've given up? We get a translator involved. And when you get a translator involved, I'm just going to post this uh, poll question into the text chat. Uh, I'd like to see what you think. Felix says you're going home with a box full. <laughs> right. So back to the, the, the question, when you get a translator involved, should they hand it over? Should you just hand it over to the other person? They'll be able to do better because they can actually understand the question. Or do you want them to just only do the translations for you, but you're still in charge? Uh, again, there is no wrong answers. Both of these cases, you can make uh, well, both of these answers, you can make a case for them. I want to know what you feel. Uh, what you personally feel like uh, should should uh, I want you to, to to put yourself into that situation and make and see what you feel. Uh, really, is no uh, right or wrong answers for this because ultimately, I think it depends. Uh, but let's start with the easier one. Yep, uh, both red and sugeng. <laughs> Has uh, shares my answer because it really depends. Uh, again, like I said, it it's 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 either case. It's either A or B. Uh, it it not it's not going to be uh, one particular answer is definitely better than the other. 
I just wanted to put yourself, uh, put you in uh, in such a shoes, uh, in such a situation, and see what you feel. Because um, if you let them take over, it's usually because um, it's a customer service issue. You're not going to be able to 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 help them um, as a, as a judge. You're not. It's not a rules question. It's not an IPG issue. If it's a customer issue, uh, service issue, you probably need to. Uh, to hand them over to a, a, a tournament organizer anyway. Uh, they might have a complaint about the venue or anything of the sort that you won't be able to help them directly anyway. Um, there are some other extraordinary circumstances like um, medical emergencies that it is much more better for you to just hand it to someone else to, to uh, uh, hand it to a person who can communicate uh, in the same language as the uh, of the customer, so that you they can solve the issue uh, as as soon as it rightfully should be, or when you're not comfortable. And I want to stress that this is okay, right? Um, it is totally fine if you don't feel comfortable to attempt to take a question, uh, or attempt to have a translator help you with a call. That's fine. Uh, you don't have to feel forced to. Instead, what I would suggest when you let someone take over is that you turn it into a learning experience. Right? You observe the other judge. You, you uh, at the end of it, ask what was the scenario, talk about it. Um, if it was a rules question, you can learn a new rules interaction. If it was a different sort of scenario, um, you can ask for suggestions from that from the other judge the translator and ask them how to approach a similar call in the future but sometimes i think that um, asking them to translate only is is better and here's what i think why I think this is the best way you can make the most out of every call so that every experience can be a learning experience i think this is a good uh, way to give experience for the translators as well because this will give them an experience to work as a translator. Um, even if you, let's say you go to an event in Japan and there's a local judge who's helping you with a translator, uh, that person might not be used to working as a translator. And having to translate for you is also a very good uh, experience for them, especially if it's a simple scenario that they feel more comfortable when for example, if they are involved in a DQ investigation uh, with the head judge later on. Uh, certain situations, uh, being the first judge on the scene makes it more uh, crucial for you to be involved. Like this. For example, you might if there is something that feels wrong, uh, and if you you don't you, you don't feel very comfortable about the situation, there is something feels a bit wrong. You're the one with the with the hunch. You're the one with the the the, the that noticed something wrong. And if you get a translator involved and you try to tell them what you felt was wrong, they might not get the full picture. They might not be able to fully understand what that you saw, or what's the feeling that you felt. So. Being the first judge on the floor, uh, on the on the scene, and being involved in the entire process of the investigation is also a, a very crucial thing to do. And um, I'm not going to go too deeply about this. If you are interested about investigations, uh, if you if you're interested in investigations, uh, I did a seminar last week, and I believe it's uploaded on uh, on YouTube. Um, if you want to check it out. Uh, that would be great. Uh, Felix asks, when would be a good time to let the translator take over? Um, what would be a good time? Uh, no, um, Felix also said that I feel like I'm moving way ahead of presentation. No, um, I believe um, it's about this, right? Um, you want to you want to try to communicate with the person like so far what we talk about is um making them feel understood and making yourself be understood 
if all those attempts, uh, you feel like you have not been able to fully communicate uh, those, uh, if, if you didn't feel like you managed to build a communication bridge between the two of you, uh, then it's fine to, 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 to let the translator take over. Right? You, like I said, it's important to know when you're uh, comfortable and when you're not comfortable. Right? If you're comfortable with, with um, trying with the translator, then yes, uh, by all means, if you feel that it's going to take too much time, uh, then maybe it's time to, uh, and that you're worried about the time that you're taking uh, to solve the issue, or you think that the issue might potentially take much more time than, uh, than you initially thought, then it's fine for them to take over as well. Sometimes, however, um, and this has happened to me, is that when we ask for a translator, um, we get hijacked. The person, you want, the, you want a translator, you want them to translate the call so you can still um, be in the call as the primary judge. But however, the other person just takes over the entire call. Have you witnessed something like that before Felix asked or personal experience? Yes, yes, this has, this has happened to me. And um, that's fine. Let, let, if, if they hijacked the call and they got the problem dealt with quickly, and if you don't feel that it's very important, for example, if it's not a, a cheating investigation, you can let them take over. And then after uh, the interaction has finished, give feedback. Like, uh, explain to them why you would have preferred to take the call and why you have preferred, uh, you would have preferred to be uh, the, the other person to be your translator and be the translator only. Um, suggest that you can, uh, sorry, move ahead too much. Um, ask why, right? Why did the other person like, try to understand why they felt the need to take over the call. It's possible that they didn't know that you want to uh, them to be a translator. There might be some miscommunication. So it's very important to understand what the other person was thinking first before you make judgments on yourself for your, uh, on the other person. And uh, give them suggestions. Uh, suggest that they give you the opportunity to be more involved. Uh, because you might want to fulfill your needs to provide value for the TO uh, because you want to to be more involved because you want to to do judge calls instead of just um, you know being another body on the floor uh, I want to I want to also chime in that these are very good basic steps on how to give feedback um, as asking the other person's point of view first is very important to clear any potential misunderstandings. You, if you look at someone and then the, someone did something that you thought was wrong, they might have a reason for it. So always start with trying to understand the other person first, just like communication. Let's move into some practical scenarios. Uh, this is Ricardo, um, very famous um, high-level judge who is often a uh, head judge in, uh, in events in our area. I'm sure a lot of you who have been to Magic Fest are very familiar with Ricardo. Ricardo is officiating a wedding in GP Chiba 2015. That was um, the first ever GP wedding that I've ever seen. And I have uh, witnessed a few ever since then, uh, which is which is still awesome every time it happens. Let's uh, let's talk about a few uh, actual stories and and and, and scenarios that uh, with that it's quite common in in foreign events. Um, Oracle text cards translation. This is probably one of the most common. Uh, judge calls you get when you're in a in an event where there's very diverse. Uh, crowds of people. Uh, 
if someone asks you for oracle text uh, take note that oracle text is just in english uh, there is no non-english oracle text if you want to know if if a person wants to know um for example if he's holding an english card and they ask for oracle text what they might mean is they want the translations for the cards uh, what you can do is you can go to scry4.com uh, even on gatherer.visus.com as well if this printed in the those uh, other languages they'll be able to give you the, the translations for them um, you can use apps like mtg manager on android uh, sorry mtg manager and devil ends uh, these apps have uh, a camera function that you can scan the card and they'll be able to tell you what the card is, uh, even if the card is in a foreign language, uh, which is very helpful. So that you can be able to, uh, if someone asks you for uh, uh, English player is playing in the Japanese event, and they found a Japanese card and they would like to know what the card actually does, um, and if you then no one knows how to say the English card name, you you might be very difficult for you to look up the card in uh in your in your judge in your app so having these apps that can scan the card and give you the card uh is very useful in these situations uh ron mentioned in the chat says that this is a, a common occurrence especially if the local judge knows very well <laughs> yeah uh, you can infer from their body language and the way they talk to the player mm -hmm. So it's always uh, good to read the oracle text, even if the cards are in English, um, because mistranslations and typos exist. Um, in this version of, uh, in the Japanese version of Atwasu, the last line uh, of the, the, so you, for this, this spell, uh, puts a plus one plus one counter on a creature you control, and then it fights another creature that you don't control. If you pay at least three green mana to cast this spell, the creature you control gets indestructible until end of turn. So the, the creature that was fighting gets uh gets indestructible. In the Japanese version, the originally printed text says that all your creatures gets indestructible. So that makes it a much more powerful spell than the actual card actually is. So something to watch out for. And this is not the only uh, mistranslation, mistranslation or typo that exists in uh, in Magic. Speaking of being hijacked, my cat is hijacking the seminar. You okay? What's wrong? What's wrong? <laughs> Someone's asking for attention. I, I, okay. All right, all right. Let's move on. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Right, um, another scenario that um, that you might frequently uh, come across is uh, it's okay to double confirm the instructions that you get. So if someone who's trying to give you instructions is not being clear about it, uh, or you, it's uh, the the way the English instructions was given to you, you you didn't really understand it. It's okay to double confirm it. It's better to take an extra minute to confirm it rather than to act on wrong instructions. Um, Sugeng asks, how do we know if there's a misprint then? Um, just check the English cards. Uh, just check the oracle text always. If there's more, it's very much more often than not that the situation is that the, the card is correctly printed. The, the misprint is not that common. But when, uh, for example, that this example, right? If the player is confused, uh, on what the spell does, uh, you'll be able to to tell them that no, only your creatures. And then if they, for example, uh, in this scenario where the player keeps telling you that you know they point out to the last part, then you kind of get a hint that there's something wrong with the text. That you, it's it's not obvious, uh, especially if you don't know the local language. So this will uh, it's. 
relies on you being able to notice the fact that they are referring to possibly misprinted text. Uh, in these situations, then you get someone involved. Um, and even if you didn't get the hint that there's something wrong with the, with the printed text, it's possible that it, when you are uh, having a long conversation or trying to understand what this person is trying to say, that you probably get a, 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 a local translator involved at this point. You probably should get a local translator in, uh, in, in at this point. So that person will be able to, to highlight this. Um, on the... Uh, on the same topic, uh, what happens sometimes in uh, when we go to a, a non-local event, especially in Jap Japanese event, is that the local players might point out these things uh, before the event. That they they say that hey, by the way, you know, there's this issue and there's this issue, or there's this misprint and that misprint. So um, it's not that uncommon to know about these things uh, as long as you're paying attention to the pre-event communications. I hope that answers your question, Sumi. Uh, if you if there's uh, if you're unsure about it, um, I'll be happy to to expand on it later. On. All right. Um, there is a situation where a judge, uh, a player, might insist on a specific judge. For example, in uh, in this was in. Uh, I believe it was a player's tour where the, the there's a Korean player that only insists on having the one Korean judge uh, in, on staff to help him. And um, that is not so, it's something that we try to do, uh, but we also try to avoid 100% uh, all the time because there's, this, is a, this is a very tricky thing where you need to balance between uh, customer service and impartiality. Uh, like you cannot have a player have a uh, sort of his what is effectively his own personal judge to handle all the communication issues. Right. Um, you need to be able to if you if you are uh, faced with such a situation where a player is insisting on a specific judge only, you need to balance. You need to try and uh, look at all the context that's provided. Try and understand what is the situation. And then make the decision on whether or not this is a situation that you really need that that uh, translator. Right. Um, if the player is able to get that same judge over and over again, it might give a very wrong impression as well uh, to the other players. Like how? Why is this person getting uh, his own personal judge? Uh, it's 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 uh, it reflects negatively upon the tournament organizer as as well as the judge program. Um, another thing is that that judge also is a resource for the rest of the tournament, not just to you. Um, that he might be needed doing other things rather than to just wait on one particular player. Uh, a few things, uh, a few stories that I'd like to share. Uh, again, I want to stress that this is from um, from events that I, I personally encountered. Okay or nodding is just signs of acknowledgement. Like very common, a very very common uh, scenario is that a player. <laughs> Sorry, that was Jill. <laughs> she is very she is being very needy this morning for some reason. Um, where we talk, where were we? Okay, we're talking about saying okay, right? This is a very common issue where uh, there there's a disagreement on whether or not a spell has resolved. Right? It's very very common where uh, in, uh English speaking player is playing against a Japanese uh, speaking player, and then the English speaking player plays a spell, and the Japanese player says okay, and the player the other player proceeds to resolve the spell, thinking that the OK is just, is um, OK, the spell resolves. And that it is very often, I won't say 100% of the time, 
but it's very often in in Japan to to acknowledge what you just did or acknowledge what you just said uh, rather than uh, using that as an indicator that it is resolving. Uh, it is very common to for them to to acknowledge the fact that you did or you said something. This is not an indicator of passing priority. So it's always very uh, tricky. And the difficulty is actually on uh, explaining to the other player why uh, this is not a sign of uh, passing priority or resolving spells. Uh, judge calls are very silent in Japan. They either speak very softly or they don't they don't yell judge at all. And instead they raise their hands. Uh, it's a tricky thing because you need to use your eyes, not just your ears. Um, judge clumping, which is like a bunch of judges coming together to talk, is um, a very dangerous thing because sometimes uh, it, uh, I want to say that I, I think that this, uh, having judges come together and share experiences, talk to each other, is not a bad thing. But this makes it much more difficult to, uh, to notice a hand that was raised behind you. So it kind of have to watch out for these sort of things. So when I made this, uh, this seminar, it was, was uh, for a Western audience. Um, my experience so far in, uh, in Southeast Asia is much more like Europe, where it is much more in between the conservativeness of Japan and uh, the very much more uh, uh, looking for a better word to say than wild. <laughs> the wild, wild west. Um, players who value their freedoms more uh, than that Uh, in in Japan, uh, for in in the US, for example, um, like we we in Southeast Asia, we are used to hurrying to a judge call, right? Feels like oh, there's a customer, and uh, he has an issue. We want to get to them as soon as possible. Uh, and in Japan, it is encouraged for you to be rushing there. You, know, you, you like there there are, there are judges who who run towards the player. Um, I wouldn't recommend that you run. I would recommend that you 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 walk a little bit faster. Uh, but in in the US, it is very heavily discouraged to do so because uh, you might give the wrong impression that uh, there is an emergency or there is a fire, for example, and that running is not professional. But in Japan, however, it is the entire opposite where it feels more professional because you are. Um, you are giving the customer priority. You are giving their needs a priority, so you are addressing that needs by hurrying to them. Um, in the US, especially, having public uh, displays of emotions is very, very common, like high fives, hugs, you know, loud greetings that generate a lot of attention is, is, is common. It's common and it's, um, it's something that is, that doesn't even, makes others doesn't even bat an eyelid. Uh, but however, it is in Japan is the, the opposite because it can be considered rude. Uh, it can be considered disruptive. So that's not a good thing. So it's this sort of cultural differences, uh, is something that you need to take in, 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 into account when you are judging in a foreign event uh, because you need to know what is considered a normal thing in that, uh, in that situation. Um, another, another cultural difference would be the, the hierarchy uh, within a team. Um, Western judges, uh, has a much more greater degree of um, independence. So they, they usually will go and do things uh, on their own uh, more. And that whereas in a much more Asian uh, mentality, we usually wait for, we as Asians wait for being uh, to be told to do something, then only we do things. 
And I believe, my personal uh, opinion is uh, you need to be able to strike a good balance in between. You want to show initiative and be independent and be able to, to know that you have the skill to know what needs to be done at a particular time. If you have the skill and experience, you should do that. However, if you are in a team, if you are a team member, you let your other team members or your team leader know first that you would like to do this thing before you go ahead and do it. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a major difference there. Uh, instead of waiting to be told or doing things on your own immediately, uh, strike a balance. Right? If you're waiting to be told to do things, um, things might be more orderly, but things might be addressed uh, on a slower or on a, on a lower pace. If you do things independently, um, things might be, get be done quicker. Uh, so uh, problems might not occur because um, problems might be solved before it occurs. However, you might generate new problems if uh, your team leader or your other team members are doing the same same things as you are, but later or slower. And uh, then that might cause potential conflicts as well. Uh, checking on the chat. Based on your experience, what country is the most challenging to judge events at? Culturally speaking, or is it more of a cultural difference, really? Mm, they all have their challenges. Um, like, even between, even within uh, Southeast Asia, you will have uh, slight differences. Uh, you will have, you will feel the, the foreignness uh, if you, if you're, for example, when you go to Bangkok, if you're from, uh, for me, as a Malaysian, when I go to Bangkok, the environment is different. The players might be chatting in a, in a, in a language that I don't understand. Or even in Manila, uh, where even if a lot of players are speaking in, in English, you will hear a lot of Tagalog or um, some other languages as well. Um, even if mentality and the, the um, player culture is similar, there will still be differences. And that, on its own, is a challenge, right? You don't when you don't feel a hundred percent familiar or comfortable, you might it might be easier for you to do mistakes. So, in other words, it was a very long winded way of me saying um, uh, that I I can't really say <laughs> that which one is more challenging. Uh, like even in an uh, event like in the states, where I can understand the I can understand everyone because everyone is speaking English. Um, it's far more less common to hear uh, non English uh, a language other than English in in an American event, for example. Yeah, Chiro. Everyone say hi to Chiro. She's been bugging me all day. Did you not get fat? All right. Uh, where were we? Oh yeah, <laughs> talking about how well, we're talking about uh, in in the states, right? Like in the states where I can understand everyone. Um, they are. I would use the last Vegas. Uh, I was hit judging a PTQ. Yeah, it, it was actually a PTQ rather than an MCQ because it was players to a qualifier, I believe. And the players there are much more challenging of your authority. Right? When you tell someone that this is my decision uh, in, 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 in Southeast Asia, uh, they might argue. And then right, if you put your foot down, you know, they, they, uh, they usually will say, okay, fine. Now, I'm going to complain to the TRTO later or something like that. But in Vegas, I had a player who will, who constantly challenges it, challenge, uh, challenge my decision. It's like it will always be being confrontational from even from the, the investigations uh, uh, when I was starting the investigation all the way until the point where uh, I put my foot down and say, this is my final decision. 
the the player was always challenging, um, trying to to make me change my mind. And at one point that I have to offer the the player, um, this cannot go on. Would you like to talk to the 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 tournament organizer, Channel Fireball, um, because there's uh, there's no other way to escalate this, because I was a head judge, and then only the player gave up, and then we have to continue with a very long time extension. So that that has its own challenge, even when when uh, languages is the same, right? Uh, just culturally, there is a difference. Whereas in uh, in Japan, where there might be communication issues and trying to understand each other, uh, they are much more accepting of decisions. Right? Uh, I have to usually encourage the other person to get a second opinion because I felt that uh, when I give a ruling to in Japan. And it wasn't something that was beneficial for the player. So he doesn't seem very happy about it. Uh, and then when I suggested, would you like to appeal to the head judge? They say no. Uh, but you can tell that they're not happy. They are much more accepting authority. Authority says, uh, this is how it works. And then it's like, oh, okay, fine. Uh, but sometimes it's good service for them to have a second opinion, especially if the second opinion can be in... Uh, uh, for example, in in Japan, we uh, we might have a Japanese uh, red shirt that can take the appeal, uh, and if you have to like encourage the other person to appeal to get a second opinion, uh, to make them feel uh, easier to to accept. So yeah, um, they all have their own different challenges, uh, and they are all very interesting in the in in that sense. And I really really miss uh, going through all these different challenges in their own way. Hope that answers your questions. <laughs> right, does anyone else have any question, or if they have their own uh, stories that they want to share? I'm sorry to have taken up so much of your time. Uh, we are already approaching the one hour and fifteen minutes mark. Uh, this has been uh, an interesting topic to be talking about because it has it brings up a lot of uh, memories, uh, very making me feel very nostalgic. Uh, and also very grateful and uh, appreciative of all the opportunities that I've had. Uh, I'm also very grateful and I really appreciate all the experiences that I've had with um, everyone. Uh, and I really miss a lot of these faces. And this is a picture from GPKL 2014, my first GP. I really miss you guys. Does anyone else have any questions before we end the, the, the seminar?